Hi, welcome to the show. Today's guest is Shannon Howard, Senior Research Analyst here at Impact International. She's in our International Development Division and will be talking to us today about international M&E or monitoring and evaluation, as well as surge support for USAID and some of her other work here, including uh, some information about how to get involved in the field of monitoring and evaluation. Welcome to the show, Shannon. How are you? Thanks. Can we start by maybe telling us a little bit about yourself and your, give us your background and what you do here at Impact? Um, I've been at Impact for about a year and I moved from Mozambique back to Washington, D.C. Um, I'm a senior research analyst in the International Division, as you said, and I'm kind of responsible mostly for our USAID funded activities and projects that we're doing. Um, I've worked a little bit on some World Bank issues as well, but mostly USAID just because I used to work in USAID. Um, so that's what I'm doing so far. Good. Can you tell our listeners about what is m and &E and also what is m and &E surge support? Okay, m and &E is monitoring and evaluation. Um, a lot of times people put it together, which is great, uh, but monitoring is kind of the day-to-day -day monitoring and looking at the progress of a project or a portfolio or an activity. Um, what might some examples of projects well, be? Well, we, what we use a lot is we talk a lot about indicators and what, are, what type of indicators or what kind of data points are we looking at to make sure that a progress is meeting its goals, meeting its objectives. It could just be very strictly number of people trained, mm -hmm. which we kind of call an output indicator. Um, or it could look more at high level um, issues like macroeconomic policies and uh, GDP growth, um, number of jobs created. Those are much higher level, goal level um, indicators that we try to look at um, and include in a lot of the monitoring plans. Mm -hmm. Evaluation is a little bit different. It's looking back and seeing if progress, progress was obtained or attained or if the goals were met. It really depends on what type of project you're looking at. Is it a long-term project? Is it a short-term project? Uh, how many pe different people does it involve? Different regions and locations. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what you want or to Or the look subject at. area, education subject area, versus education, agriculture yeah. probably have very different tools and methodologies. They do, yeah. So you could look at simply counting people on paper or using um, mobile tablets or things like that. Um, to, uh, we're working on some things right now with remote sensing in the wash, which is water, agriculture, sanitation, and, and um, hygiene. And remote sensing l looks at how can we remotely see uh, the water quality that people are using or how often they're accessing water pumps, uh, kind of at which volumetric pressure is the water coming out at, some, some kind of higher level scientific um, data points that we want to look at, um, which we can do from here. We don't have to be in the field to do that. Um, other tools we use are just kind of Excel spreadsheets that, that people fill in on a regular basis and send back to us or send back to their headquarters and aggregate data, disaggregate data. Good. So it want. ranges from the high tech to the pencil and paper, I Pencil imagine. and paper, but we're trying to really get away from pencil and paper, I think, mm -hmm. kind of in general. Pencil and paper is expensive. Uh, it can get lost, it can get destroyed, it can, it's expensive to send around. Um, mobile data platforms are much more uh, user friendly in some ways. Um, not so literate populations can sometimes use them a little bit easier actually than paper. Mm. And um, the cost of sending it in a timely manner is much, much, much cheaper than paper or pencil. Of course, the cost though that we we sometimes in the U.S. kind of forget about is infrastructure, the data infrastructure costs. Mm -hmm. If there's no data available or no phone lines available, um, it's a little bit harder to get access to that data. But in most countries now, there there is a way to get to it. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us what is surge support? Why would USAID need surge support, and and what is it? Surge support is when a mission. Uh, and when I talk about mission, I mean a USAID office, let's say in Ghana, which is where I was providing a lot of surge support over the last year. Or, you know, it could be Sri Lanka or uh, Azerbaijan or um, Armenia, something like that. They put a request in the USAID Washington that they need more assistance in, the, in their m and &E work. It could be capacity building. Maybe they just need, um, on a quarterly basis, they need 
um, some extra hands to come in and help with aggregating data or reading through reports or getting a project started and getting a project's m and &E started from the USAID side. Um, one of my situations is that a, the m and &E officer had left the office and there was going to be a pretty big, big um, gap in when they were able to hire a new person. And so I came in for about nine months off and on and provided as much um, in-country and virtual uh, support, support here from DC to the Ghana office. Um, and I did all sorts of things. I met with partners. I helped them um, improve their monitoring and evaluation plans, which mm -hmm. is kind of a, it's an official document that they have to give to USAID showing how they're going to do their monitoring and evaluation throughout the life of their project. Um, so I would review those and, and provide, you know, ask some questions, ask for clarifications or, you know, um, make recommendations on, well, this is maybe what USAID wants to see. Um, but how are you going to do that? Good. And can you tell us what is it about this work that you find personally rewarding? Um, wow. So I have a really unique opportunity to work with a lot of different people from a lot of different countries in a lot of different ways. Um, even within our own division here, in impact, not everybody is from the same place. They don't all speak the same languages. They have different academic backgrounds, which is really interesting. Um, but I also get to work in countries, I get to work with government officials, either a government official from a host country, from let's say Ghana or Senegal, or I work with American um, government officials, diplomats, people who work for USAID or the State Department, um, and just kind of learn like what their needs are and what, what are the reasons that they're doing their work and try to help everybody do their work better. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really interesting. I've traveled to a lot of places. I've learned how to figure things out without knowing the language or knowing it just well enough to get into a lot of trouble, <laughs> which has happened. Um, and I think that's kind of the motivating factor. And also, I am kind of a research nerd. So I'm able to do that, but have a really interesting time doing it. It's good. You said something really interesting to me about how you can help people do their work better. Is that the goal yeah. of evaluations? Y oh, absolutely. I mean, when, when you talk about evaluation, um, the, the main feature is evidence-based programming, evidence-based policy. You, the only way you can get a lot of this evidence to make your programming better, to create policies, or to create programs from scratch is if you have evidence. And the only way you get that evidence is by doing evaluation. Yeah. Or also just monitoring data. You don't have to do an evaluation to get evidence. If it's already existing somewhere out there. Yeah. Then you can so you it. have a background in public policy. Yeah. At least I know you have two degrees in public policy. Yeah. Is that the typical route? How do people get into <laughs> this, this kind of work? What are, what, are some, um, what, are, what are some ways that people can get into monitoring and evaluation? Um, I think having two policy backgrounds, it might be a, a little bit unusual, but um, public policy is a, a, an interesting degree because you can, you can get out of it what you put into it. And, and my focus was research and, mm -hmm. and, and international policy. Um, a lot of people tend to be international relations as undergrad and maybe getting their masters in economics, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the issues with trying to get a master's degree in international development, which is a big one, but more economics or political sciences that they don't really have a lot of master's programs in that field. They're not terminal degrees, which mm -hmm. means that it's not just for that, like you get it because you have a PhD. Um, so I, I would think that a lot of people have their master's in international development. That's what I see a lot of. Um, I decided not to go that route because I wanted to focus a little bit more on the research side. Um, but I had to work to make sure that it all fit in within the international rubric. Good. So, yeah. Good. All right, so let's close maybe with some advice. Do you have any tips for, uh, or thoughts for people who want to get into this line of work? Um, it's a little bit hard to say. I had the uh, fortune of moving to Tanzania with my spouse. And I was able to volunteer for two years in a local uh, organization, but it did take me about six months for that organization to allow me to work there. Mm. After many, many visits and discussions with them and other 
other people connected to that organization. Um, but this was a long time ago when not a lot of Americans just rolled into an office and wanted to work for free. It, it took a lot of uh, background uh, research and work on their part, on my part. Um, but a lot of people do, sometimes the easiest way is just to decide where you want to go, go to the country, and then look for work there when you're in country, or volunteer if you have that um, opportunity, or do an internship. I know a lot of people do internships. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of depends on what you're able to do. Um, I know it's not cheap to just go to a country and work for free, so. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Shannon, thanks for your time. Oh. And thank you for watching. That was Shannon Howard, Senior Research Analyst here at Impact International.